Hello, and welcome to the disability myth. My name is Dominic, and I live with a fatal disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Together, my amazing caretaker, co-host, and best friend, Uriel and I, plan to debunk misconceptions, share our personal experiences, and shatter your expectations. But we're not stopping there. We're bringing in experts, thought leaders, and everyday people who are smashing through societal barriers, paving the way for a more inclusive world. Whether you're tuning in to learn, empathize, or simply to be entertained, the show promises to be an eye-opening experience that transcends boundaries. Because when it comes down to it, what makes us different is what makes us extraordinary. Oh yeah, that's copyright. That's that's probably like way too loud. I probably just pierce people. I mean, that's Nintendo stuff. You don't want to yeah. get fried by Nintendo. Oh, no cease and desists for me. That's getting cut out. Okay. Welcome back to another episode of the Disability Myth. I am, of course, your handsome and humble host, Dominic Trevithan. Alongside me, as usual, the equally handsome and humble. Oh, what was that sound? <laughs> me. Oh, you, you're right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not not goofy at all. <laughs> no. All right. So today we kind of have a big announcement. What is it? This will Tell be. Him. This will be. Drum roll, please. Oh, I can't do it. Oh uh, man. Okay. Oh, well, this will be the last episode of season one of the disability myth. Blam, blam, blam. Oh, that blows. <laughs> but don't worry, because we're coming back for more next season. We're gonna be back right. even bigger and better. This is um harder, stronger, faster. Yep, just like Daft Punk and Kanye. Is that a Kanye song? I didn't know. It's Daft Punk and then Kanye sampled it. Yeah, it's crazy. What a small world. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, this is our last episode for season one. Grand finale. Um, The reason we are ending now is we like the number 10, or at least I do. I'm a bit, you know, OCD'd out. I like a nice even number to end on. This Why is not episode... 12. Huh? Why not 12 like those anime episodes? That's true. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I got you thinking. That's that could be a thing, but I don't know. We don't want to like spiral out of control like Attack on Titan. So. Oh yeah. It Did that have twelve like, episodes? It would be like season finale part one, season finale part two. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, they just finished it as of the other yeah. night. Yeah, it's like an hour and a half long. I wanted to watch it last night, but I was like, dude, I'm gonna be too sleepy to finish it. Oh. <laughs> I gotta watch it like a, a proper daytime thing like a movie you know it is it's a movie length i wasn't expecting attack and titan to be that like the finale like oh anyways so yeah we wanted to finish the season on a nice even number like 10 and we figured we would take some time off to really just kind of develop a backlog that we can you know rely on for season two what we want to do is start producing episodes kind of in mass and allowing us more time to edit them, produce them, get them to the best quality they can possibly be. Um, oh, so yeah. that way, you know, the listeners, you guys have a better experience um, should, overall. That's the goal. You should, you should tell them that we were pulling a South Park where we would have to, well, at least with my schedule of school and family and all that, and then you're, you have your appointments and family. We yeah. were writing and recording like we're planning writing and recording episodes every week you know yeah. like and it ended up being a lot and then we realized yeah. oh maybe we should have just recorded like uh, a few episodes right and and people really told us out. that before we even started that we should record several episodes and then publish once we have them ready to publish boy did they prove us right Boy, I mean, did they wrong. prove us right? Yeah, I, I'm mean, wrong. Sorry. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Anyways, yeah. um, yeah. So lesson learned for all 
you future podcasters and content creators out there uh lesson you can take from us is start producing episodes in mass before you start publishing that unless you're a live show then good luck yeah good luck to you tip of the hat oh yeah (laughs) I say um too much to go live. So yeah, with the with that being said, this is season one grand finale. I don't know how grand it'll be. It might be a little bit shorter, a little bit sweeter, perhaps. We just kind of wanted to go over pretty much what we've learned throughout the season and cover just a little bit of the myths that we've talked about. Um, just to kind of reiterate some points, talk about whatever we may have learned from the, doing all this, because uh I don't know about you but i've definitely gotten a lot out of this whole experience a lot that i'd never expected to get out of it <laughs> and uh, i definitely feel like i'm coming out of season one a better person because of it and i'm excited to really take what we've learned from this season and just add to it and get better for season two yeah like um because of school and how busy i've been um You've been holding the fort down on the garage band, but <laughs> I got um studio one. There we go. Oh well. Um, yeah, it should be fun. Learned a few things like um it's a little stressful to outline. Yeah. I, I my question is like, I wonder how many other like content producers and creators outline their material because you know, I'm just, I, I need structure in my life. I'm that type of person. I can't really just wing it. I have to have some type of structure. So I I, I kind of wonder if there's anybody out there listening that does do podcasting or content creation at all, how much you, you outline. I'm curious. I think TikTok content is extremely lightly scripted. Mm-hmm. Probably. Um, yeah, because from what I can tell or what what I've seen is that people on TikTok, they go around and they try to find a place that's suitable to record and all that. And then they'll do multiple takes until it feels right. And then they'll go to a different location, continuing the storyline. It's like, how do I ext- describe it? It's like um improvised storytelling. Yeah. Well I, well, I don't know if you've seen it with like all these like super like fast speed like zoomer like uh TikToks or short form videos where one second they're here, jump cut, and now they're over there, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you realize in the background, oh, we went from like morning now it's sunset. Like it took them a whole day to record this 15 second video they got. It's a whole skit, right? Yeah, millions of views, right? Right. Well, that's what I've seen. Well, that's what I'm assuming people do. Because that's probably what I would do if, if it was just, if it was just me, if I had a team, right? Some like light planning, like oh today I'm going to, I don't know, capture an alligator, like, <laughs> like a small little baby alligator, and then jump cut a bunch of um parts that I think are interesting, and then once I actually find it, show it off to the audience. Look at this thing, mm-hmm. isn't this cool? And then release it. And then that's it. That's that's the that's content the of the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's um but that's light scripting or just kind of I mean, even with videos like that, I guess you could argue that there is a plan or some sort of goal before they went out to record, right? Yeah. Like I always think about, you know, starting content for the disability myth and video content specifically and i i start thinking like what would i even want to show or like make videos about maybe just like simple little stuff of me eating like to show how i hold like my food and my fork um how i have to like t-rex hand my fork and stuff like that um show how you know i game in like a video or something again with the t-rex claw strat uh there's a lot of you know unique little ways I get stuff done that I think might be good, but I'm not sure. So, you know, if you want to see stuff like that, let us know. I'll put a, a poll up again so you guys can respond. And uh, yeah, I think, th- I think that could be really fun, like doing 
if not TikToks, like YouTube Shorts or Instagram Reels and stuff like. Oh, not Shorts, man. <laughs> huh? Not Shorts. No, I feel like those. That's where um TikTok videos go to die, mm-hmm. like the graveyard of um, like the uh, Reels or short form videos. Or content, I feel. I feel like they don't do as well. Gotcha. Maybe, that, maybe I could. I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're there for a reason, right? Like somebody's got to be looking at them. Oh God, me at like three in the morning. You're like me at three in the morning when I have no more Instagram reels to look at. Oh, okay, you know what? Yeah, we'll put it put ourselves on blast. I've done that before, where there's some nights where I can't differentiate between. YouTube and Instagram, and I'm so tired. <laughs> it's like, right? And I'm going for reels. I'm like, oh, what? Is, where? I, you know, I you're can't like tell the, what app I'm in. You're like both of the apps are like a shade of you know red. So, <laughs> Instagram, I guess it's like purple. I think. Yeah. But it's really similar where it's just it takes up the whole screen and it's just a video and then you flick or whatever, swipe. And it's a, whoa, brand new content. Whoa. Yeah. All right. Should we jump back into uh, our season recap? Yes. My name is Jay. So the myth for our first episode that we covered was um, Burden Complex. Well, you know, technically episode one, we just did like a general introduction to us, I guess. And, you know, I told the Walmart story, the classic, the Oscar Grammy not Grammy, um, Oscar, Tony winning story. I could have sworn that was episode three or something. That's no, crazy. dude, you're tripping. That was episode I'm one. I'm tripping. That's, oh my God. You started off with an uh, absolute banger, I guess. Just, yeah. I guess we were really passionate about it at that time. Yeah. Well, it's just like my go-to story for when people ask me about my disability or oh, when I even right. just think about my disability. That's always kind of the story that comes to mind um because it's it's i don't know it's just a core and mem- a core memory and walmart it's just kind of my quintessential challenge your assumption story and i think that's what we ended up titling episode one was challenging assumptions with dom and uri yeah and uh yeah good times good times but yeah the first proper episode slash myth that we did was on burden complex and the idea or the myth was that asking for help makes you a burden how do you feel after uh, after releasing that episode um i don't feel too much different i will say and we've talked about it since that episode aired that you know i think i realized that in the past i've kind of used my burden complex as like a crutch or an excuse to be lazy, to just not go after my goals. Exhibit A being public speaking, like we've talked about, that's something I really want to do. And I'm kind of hesitant to just reach out to people and ask if I can speak at their events or their schools and whatnot because of my whole transportation situation. But, you know, it doesn't hurt to like ask and make new contacts, contacts and network. Even if I may be limited transportation wise, there are you know other venues I can explore via you know Zoom. Uh, a few years ago, I gave a speech to Mrs. Rasmussen's class over Zoom, and so that's like a perfect example of you know. There's no reason I can't just reach out to former teachers of the school that we went to and inquire about speaking because there's uh, different ways that I can do it. I don't have to physically go anywhere. And it's not like that's a super far away place in the first place. You know, I'm sure if it worked out, like you could drive me there and we can make it work. Yeah. I think uh, the main conflict here was that your burden, compl- you, didn't, you felt bad asking uh your grandparents to drive you around because it's taxing on them yeah and And i think felt weird sorry sorry Uh, i I think that's reasonable still because it is taxing on them 
and then I'm not available 24 seven. And then the mm -hmm. transit public transit, it's not a public thing. Sorry. The through Sencal, the, which what, what do you call it? The Valley. This is oh, Valley the transit. one that we take two appointments. Yes. That's so that's only for like medical appointments, uh, Ventura transit center. No, that's right. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's like a bus that goes through the Valley. So like, if I got opportunities, dope will, there's always like the Valley Transit. That's like, I think a dollar per person if you have Medi-Cal or something. Oh, yeah. Have you used them before? Is it an a long time ago? How do you get on? Before my grandparents bought um, the van for me, that's what I used to go to school, uh, high school originally. How long did that take? How long was that? Um, I think it was just for a couple of months, like a month or two. I first moved to Solving when I was 13. And it was towards the end of the school year. So I think in April or late May, I started at the high school. And you know, it was weird because I had missed three or four months of school because of my spinal fusion operation. Oh, I had. And, you know, I spent like two or three months in rehab following that. And that's why I missed so much school. So when I got back to school, whole new school, because before living here, I lived in Oxnard. And so, yeah, whole new school, missed like three months of school. And I had to like basically catch up in a couple of weeks in order to take finals. So, yeah, it was a whole thing. <laughs> and I would take the transit, like the Valley Transit bus to get to the school until we got the the caravan in the summer. So it's a rear loader, huh? They have a proper bus that has like a ramp that drops down. Oh, shoot. Is that all of their buses or only a few of them? I'm not sure. But yeah, this one, the valley has, it has like a ramp that drops down from the side and it's like a school bus. If you've, if you've seen like the school bus ramps, they're like yeah. a whole hydraulic system. So yeah. Oh, that's it's dope. pretty cool. Yeah. Cause I, um, some of them have like uh, that contraption in the back. And mm. some of them the most of them do i just i never really seen it in action similar to when you go to public universities or public schools and they have those elevator contraptions all over the place for disabled people yeah it's not like that except when the ramp is all the way up to the level of the bus it folds up inside and like a door okay. closes it off yeah it's a the, th the the thing about those elevator contraption things, I never know if they actually work because I never see them used. In all my time of high school, I've never once seen any of the bleacher elevators or any of that used. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I ever used the bleacher ones. Did we? Like no, you thing? asked. I remember we had right. like a whole little. Uh, right, because I, I wanted to go up and they, they had said like it wasn't working or something. Yeah, I was dis we were disappointed. It was a very ableist moment. <laughs> I forget if it was after high school or was it during? No, it was during. Because why would we go? Why would we go to the high school football game? That's right. That's right. That's, right. that's right. That's cringe. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and no, uh, you're right. I have like. Somebody asked me, are you going to the football game? I was like, there's literally no reason for me to. It's wacky. Why would I? Yeah. It's kind of weird. Unless you're like really into football, like to the extent that you would just go to a, a high school game. Nah, dude. Our team's mid. Besides, there's a college football, man, and other stuff to watch. Yeah. College and NFL, yep. Anyways, just to kind of get back on track, I think the, the main point that we were trying to make is that there's a lot of different ways I can do what I want to do that doesn't put necessarily a burden on other people. So it's just about making the effort to, you know, stop making excuses 
and just go out and do what I want to do. Yep. That's what I've learned. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right, and so then episode technically three, the second myth that we covered was with Genevieve, and that was that people with disabilities are unable to succeed academically. And that was pretty cool. We got to talk with her about her experience at um, Cal Lutheran. That's crazy how that was only our third episode. Like, I'm looking back on it. I'm like, oh, wow, that felt I felt like we had been doing it for way longer than, what, three, four weeks at that point? Yeah. Like, I think we started this August. middle of October. Or, I'm sorry, August. Yeah. So it's been a few months now. It's crazy. Oh, God. This is like, uh, almost feels like a, like a school project almost. Like a semester-long project. Yeah. Well, to be fair, I think that Genevieve one took us a week and a half to get sorted out because that was our first guest, I recall. Yeah, that, that one was a big learning curve because it was like our first proper guest. We didn't really know what we were doing outlining wise and she yeah. was kind enough to kind of help us steer the ship with that and get us a little bit more organized so <clears throat> that's what i mean like i feel like we've really kind of taken a lot there's a lot that we can take away from season one and we can build off of it you know like our outlines are good but i'm sure they can be better and more organized and you know keep us on track even more somehow some way some some shape or form so agreed yeah but um yeah no, that was fun and obviously we kind of busted that myth you know me and her kind of proof that that's just a pretty outdated way of thinking right uh yeah i, I understand she went to cal lutheran but um i was talking to some other people about this is that if your goal requires a bachelor's or some form of academic credential, um, I've spoken to several people about this, is that sometimes it's best just to go with the public universities or the state schools, man, and save a buck. Yeah, private schools are expensive. Yeah, right? And it's... It's... um. It's hard telling people, but sometimes the dream school, even though, well, well there it's a dream school, right? And even if you can get into it, it might not always be the best yeah. well, option you, for you. I think what's it, important to keep in mind is like, not only are you a dream school, but what's practical for you. For yeah. example, when I was applying to colleges, I think we talked about it on that episode with her. I applied to UCSB because it was close to me. I also applied to UCLA and um, Stanford. I think I actually never finished applying to Stanford because it was so impractical for me to go all the way up there and be so far from home. And... Yeah, I just didn't really see myself going there. Even well, though, like you was... said in the episode, sometimes your grandparents would have to come down to take mm -hmm. care of you. All the just way to LA. LA. Yeah. And that would have been more practical at UCSB, right? Totally. Mm -hmm. She didn't get accepted into USS, UCSB, I recall. Right. For some reason, I got into LA, but not SB. Wacky, so, huh? Yeah. Applying to schools is weird. And don't, like what he says, don't set your heart out on one school. Even if it is your, you know, dream school, like that's great if you get in and it works out for you. But I think what's really important to keep in mind is what's practical, um, what's gonna work best for you in your specific situation. So yeah, I'm talking as an older gentleman because I've spoken to a lot of homies, a lot of people that have gone for the college system, and a lot of them when they first start going to their new school, it's a lot. Especially if you're very family orientated. Yeah. If you're the kind of person that can go long periods of time without really talking to their family or just like be alone for a little bit. Yeah. Then 
maybe traveling isn't that big of a deal, but for some people going to a different state or going way far up north or way down south is really challenging for people. Before And I went to college, I had talked to a few different people that were in college or had been in college with a disability, like in a wheelchair. And I remember one person telling me that, you know, the worst part about it was just being far from the people you love and like being on your own, being so isolated. Yeah, no support system. You're just out there raw dogging it. Unless you're extremely lucky to like go to school near where you come, are living, you know? I'm Right, hoping. which is why I recommend like the local if you can, but I understand. Well, luckily in California, we're kind of fortunate where I know California is super long. It's a it's a long ass state, right? But I think California <laughs> yeah. is pretty fortunate in the sense that there's um a lot of schools here down the coast and you're I'm pretty sure guarantee you'll find a state school or something that's nearby. Yeah. What is there like That 23 works. CSUs, I think? Yeah. It's crazy. It's a Right? lot. Yeah. And then it's it's not a matter of what's best. You know, it's obviously you pick the one with the program that you enjoy. But also, like you said, that's practical, that's cost effective. Just to get your goal, just to achieve your goals, you know? Yeah, or just pick the one with the coolest name. Like, I don't know. I would. What's that school where you get to be the banana slug? A Santa Cruz. <laughs> Dude, I would totally go to Santa Cruz just to be a banana slug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, um, oh God. Up in Monterey, a little past Monterey, I think. It's by Monterey. I remember that. But yeah, it's beautiful up there too. Right. Cool. Like um, Channel Islands. We got a I got a couple of friends going there. Channel Islands, Mm -hmm. which is they drive there, which is insane. It's like an hour, yeah, hour and twenty minute drive, which is just crazy. I feel like it's longer from here. Yeah, but like an it's hour and a half at least. Right, but believe it or not, they actually save significantly more money just driving the L.A. twice a week. Well, it's not quite LA, right? It's almost LA. Right. Thousand Oaks, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Channel Islands. The, they save more money driving almost LA than they would if they had a student housing program. Yeah. That just, again, tells you like how expensive school is. It's not just the tuition. It's the housing. And it's the textbooks. And it's all these little things that kind of add up. So well, it's really important. to be practical, pick a school that's a good fit for you economically, right? Well, yeah, they, I think they wanted to go to UCSB at first because it was closer. Yeah. But again, they wanted to save money and Channel Islands just happened to be more um, affordable. Right. And Channel Islands has a significantly higher acceptance rate. Yeah, well, I think a lot of CSUs, I don't know if it's like a Channel Islands exclusive thing, but as long as you have over a 2.0, like they'll accept you from Well, high thank school. God. <laughs> I mean, not to say my GPA is bad, but it's just like, oh man, you know? Yeah. That's good. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, because I think they applied at UCSB. I don't think they ever got anything back, which is, you know, mm -hmm. all, all my homies can't get into UCSB. <laughs> Me and my homies, we don't mess with UCSB. <laughs> oh, it's just all my friends and uh, have applied there. None of none, no one has ever gotten a word back, even though all my friends are. Uh, I know, even you, everyone's capable. Yeah. Right. But I wonder if that's just because UCSB is just extremely popular. Right. Well, yeah, it's literally it's... like a beachside school. Right. And because of its popularity and its kind of. lax socal party culture kind of thing mm -hmm. a lot of people go there when you think about it it's like the beverly hills of ucs or like schools in general i wouldn't go that far because i don't really have a whole lot of experiences of other schools and like other school cultures mm -hmm. right all i know is that ucsb has um 
the infamous was it oh gosh is it Isla Vista no freaking yeah. that's where all the party and shenanigans happen yeah they have utopia there yeah 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 anyway um as a as my homie would say Sometimes you gotta lower your expectations a bit, not you, so you're not you're so you're not as disappointed, you know. And like, Quarter of the day. No, I'm not. I'm not saying don't go out for it. Or don't go for it. But it's just um, because I don't think anybody wants to see somebody go to their like quote unquote dream school and then they just get priced out of it, or they're far away from friends and family and they just get down bad with you know they get depressed or something right yeah here's my logic you know i already live with a disability i already have enough challenges as it is why would i want to add to that list right and make my life any harder than it has to be by being somewhere where i'm isolated where i'm financially in debt you know it's important to really think things like that through because college is such a big decision right with such lasting impacts potentially so it's important to take your time make the right decision use resources available to you like the department of rehab um your local vocational rehabilitation center fafsa all that stuff so but yeah i think the main point too is you know the the thinking behind that episode was a person with a disability can't go to college and that's you know simply not the truth like it's not there's plenty of people that do it. It's just you got to be smart about how you do it. I think is what yeah. we're trying to say. And then after after the fact, um, back then when you were in college, you didn't know about IHSS, right? Well, I knew about it. I just didn't really look into it because I was oh, okay lazy. <laughs> hey, that's all right. You still got the paper though. You see, exactly. Still, you know, you're still good. Yeah. All right, so moving on to myth number three, episode four, I believe. We talked oh, wow. with our friend Chelsea. We, that's right, back to back. That's yeah. right. That's right. About relationships between caregivers and patients and the kind of facade that they're always professional in nature. And so that was a fun episode. We talked to her about her spinal cord injury and her experience, you know, recovering from that, the adjustment that she had to make going from living completely able-bodied to living as a quadriplegic. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said it before, I'll say it again. I just, I live with a disability. I technically live with quadriplegia myself, but my experience is totally different from someone with a spinal cord injuries experience. Mine was a lot more gradual in nature, whereas people who experience a traumatic injury, um, whether it's an accident or whatever, that's a whole different thing because it's just a sudden change in lifestyle completely. And yeah, I know I, I've lived my whole life with my SMA and I've always relied on other people to help take care of me and just help me in general. And so, you know, that was really cool talking to Chelsea about how, what her experiences were with caretakers and her relationships too. So, yeah, that was fun. Yo. How would you say, you know, our relationship has changed or evolved since we first met each other in high school? Because like I said, my, my SMA, I kind of, gradually as i have gotten older have needed more help and required more from those in my life so i don't know if you've like noticed that at all since you've cared for me i I get my spinraza injections of course that help me maintain my mobility but still you know i have my good days and my bad days i don't know if you've perceived anything like needing to help me more or if you feel like just the relationship in general between us has changed since you started working for me and everything. Uh, I think the biggest wrench was probably the show, this podcast itself, because there is a lot of moments where I doubted myself or doubted my ability to contribute 
to this thing. And I was worried that it would put the strain on our relationship, right? Mm-hmm. Whether we were planning episodes or something, if we weren't going to see eye to eye or if we weren't going to see eye to eye on certain guests or if there's going to be a whole lot of conflict there. And it, it was actually around this time when we recorded this where I was like doubting myself a lot. I don't know if you remember that. I was like a little worried about how it was going to go. But yeah. then um, this caregiver episode was kind of a, a 180 where I actually enjoyed doing this yeah. one quite a bit. And we figured out a slightly better outline system. Yeah, this is when we I feel like we really started to kind of hit our stride with the podcast and get more into a flow, figuring out the outlining and the whole editing process. And yeah, it was, yeah, this is when we really started to kind of get an idea, I think, of where we wanted the podcast to go based off this episode and, you know, the relative success we had with it. So, you know, it was a good uh, episode. To go back to what I was saying, um, was there a little bit of, I'm not going to pretend like there wasn't, at times some friction but i think the cool part is that we were never not on the same page if that makes sense yeah right it's like even if there is like any like my uh any minor disagreements i felt they didn't really matter because ultimately we had a very similar goal in mind for each episode yeah and i feel like we're both pretty chill people to the point if something did bug us, bother us along the way, we're both comfortable enough to say something about where we were at with the podcast or just our work relationship in general too. You know, nonetheless, our friendship. So, yeah. Yeah, because it's wacky because um, that's probably the most asked question I've been given off the show is like oh how are you and dominic now it's just like oh we're good and people right. ask us ask about us like we're a married couple <laughs> it, it feels like it at times man because <laughs> not only not only do we have a just a regular friendship relationship where we just go out and do stuff we also have a work relationship there's um, like three layers there's like the friendship the you're my caretaker part of the relationship. Yeah, then the show. And then there's the podcast. Yeah. Right. And it's um and it feels nice knowing that I don't have to mask as hard or wear so many different uh face like I don't have to really act a whole I don't have to act differently personality wise from caregiver mode, the friend mode, the show mode. Mm-hmm which is really relaxing because for some people it's really exhausting to be or to act professional for however long and then go to a different job or something and they have to change up their personality just a bit or switch a bit yeah yeah but i don't have to do that and me not having to do that made me doubt myself a lot in terms of am i responsible enough can i actually do this at times, you know, well, at least that's how I felt. Mm-hmm. But then I realized that over time, we're not lazy people. I think we're both just kind of go with the flow kind of people. And I yeah. feel we act, we both act as cushion, like pin, like pin cushions, where I have a needle and I just lightly poke you and then vice versa. And then we get something done. Right. Like, regardless, we always kind of hold each other responsible despite whatever's kind of going on or whatever we're contemplating or working on. Yeah, because at the time we had no frame of reference for what success was or if what we were doing was actually good. I still don't know. I'm still not sure. Right, I still don't know either. But I think we're a lot more... What's the word? Like, relaxed. Oh, we're not relaxed. I feel like um, we're in... We're a lot more confident about what we're doing now. Yeah, we're not as much in our heads as we as we used to be. Right. Like, you know, we joked around episode one. I specifically recall making a little joke saying, you know, oh, to our 12 listeners out there. And 
<laughs> it's funny at the time, but you know, now you know, I don't I don't mean to brag, but <laughs> oh yeah. Well we're, we're still like, here. We're, we're, still up to here. Like, we're up to like 60 followers now. So oh, uh-huh. shit. yeah, well yeah, it's um because what I'm trying to explain to the audience is that this relationship, its complexity or any friction or whatever isn't because of you at all. All the tension and um stress that I felt was through not having a baseline or an idea of what I'm supposed to do yeah. when working on a podcast. Same. And how not and what not to do or what to do when working with someone. Right. It was mainly me getting into my own head, whether, oh, am I being responsible enough? Am I being am I am I a good partner? Am I actually like hopefully pulling my way like that stuff yeah that was getting it it was more of a mental obstacle than a oh i hope me saying this doesn't piss off dominic kind of thing because i wasn't really worried (laughs) about that i was more more worried about if i was doing enough and is and if what we're doing is actually of quality right that's always my kind of concern is what we are producing or putting out onto the internet worth somebody's attention, right? That's like the main question that it all kind of roots back to, I think, for me. You know, I want this to touch home to people that are similar to myself, to those that are living with disabilities. But at the same time, I don't want the scope of the show to be so narrow that people who are not as experienced with disabilities can't enjoy it and that's really the goal of the show is to kind of unite both sides of that spectrum of mobility so that we can all reach a more common understanding of what it's like to live with a disability right kind of a long-winded explanation trying to explain my fifis (laughs) (laughs) but um going back to the myth that we talked about on this episode, you know, it was just about relationships between caregivers and patients. And I think a lot of people see it as just a cut and dry kind of thing. When, if you don't understand it by now, I don't know if you ever will, but it's not, that's not the case, right? Like we just poured our hearts and soul into that little dialogue about how the relationships that we have are so nuanced and so complex on a multitude of levels um so it's something to keep in mind well it's like i don't know everything i do kind of improves your life by a percentage Mm -hmm. and it's um people talk about it people don't like talking about it but it's uh how it's a very repetitive job right yeah and very monotonous and then it's gonna sound ridiculous but sometimes it's so monotonous that you forget the little things you remember the big movements but like the tiny in between movements right Mm -hmm. and um i have to constantly do it just out of not only love and respect for you but like oh oh, every time i do this it just improves your life by Mm -hmm. that much and it's you know if, if ain't nobody else gonna do it right right there, there's the other timelines where like you're not my caretaker, right? In the right. ultimate timelines. <laughs> and in those timelines, my life is significantly different, probably worse. So yeah. And sometimes that responsibility or that burden for someone else is a lot to ask of someone. Mm-hmm. Especially when IHSS doesn't pay a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know. Preparing to add them in the post right now. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I enjoy it, and it, it's working out so far. It's um, because I like doing it, and literally nobody, nobody's giving out forty hours anymore, man. It's impossible. It'd be like that. It'd be like it's, that. <laughs> it's hard to find somebody, an employer that just gives a straight forty hours, or it's you can't. It's hard, man. Yeah. 
It's well, what can I say? I like to give back to the community. Hey. <laughs> All right. With that being said, well, let's move on to the f- next myth that we covered. People living with disabilities have no control over their lives. And yeah. I feel like this was a really unique kind of um, chain of episodes that we put out here because we talked about control. Then we talked about the myth that people with disabilities don't go out and have fun. And then we talked about the myth that you're either motivated or you're not. And looking back on it and thinking about how I wanted to talk about the control aspect, I feel like all three of these myths kind of go hand in hand to an extent. Uh, I feel like there's a large interplay between control and going out. Feeling like you can go out and have fun. Feeling well, I like think motivated enough to go out and have fun. Not not to take it a, another step, like a step forward, like a step higher. Right. Sorry, I said step, but um, you ass. Because <laughs> um, I've been picking your brain, and we've been having a lot of conversations behind the scenes after the burden complex episode. And I feel these topics and these episodes naturally came out of you because they were the topics that you were most wrestling with in your head at the time. Right. Because the whole burden complex, like you just mentioned it earlier, where you wanted to you wanted to do public speaking, you wanted to do all those things, but you felt as if you lacked control or you felt Mm -hmm. you were asking too much from others. Yeah. Right. And I feel that's all more interconnected than you might have thought originally definitely Definitely. and i feel like the past like five weeks have you just been coming to terms of like oh the only person holding me back is probably myself yeah and like the way i perceive things yeah right so if i don't feel like if i don't perceive myself having control over that whole situation then i'm never gonna like pursue the public speaking in the first place because i feel like i can't so and that's obviously not not the case it's literally just my own head kind of holding me back but uh, that was that was a cool little chain of episodes like you said though it all kind of goes hand in hand with each other um if someone doesn't feel like they can go out and have fun it's probably because of the lack of feeling of their feeling like they're in control their perception of that of their control if they don't feel motivated to go out and do stuff then you know it's probably because they don't feel like they're in control which i feel it's a very common thing where the humans tend i say humans but uh oh, yeah like because you got to clarify because you could be talking about you know aliens <laughs> yeah well people and the ghosties um uh, when things kind of aren't going their way they tend to focus on the negative things that are out that they feel are outside of their control. I know you mentioned it on that episode, but you can control, you have control on your actions and your attitude and how you deal with stuff. Right. Right. And here it's kind of um, an attitude change where you're trying to shed this self doubt and this burden that you feel that you're that you feel uh, that you're placing on others right and you're coming to the terms with these obstacles you've set out for yourself don't actually exist Mm -hmm. until you run into them right until your grandparents say sorry bud i'm too tired i just can't my old age right Mm -hmm. then you ask me right then is that really a problem at that point Right, right. Right, if you want to go do public speaking, if you want to do all this stuff, just nobody's stopping you from sending an email. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's, you know. It's that simple. Right. It's literally just like the idea of that that monkey monkey brain in the back of your head, right? Like, oh, yeah. Some sort of trauma response or something. Right, like you just, you don't want to put people in situations. Or I don't want to put people in situations that make them uncomfortable to the point that I kind of limit myself. And that's something that I need to kind of work with and get better about 
not doing. So, and then I think the final myth that we covered was uh, assistive technology being accessible to everyone. That was kind of a fun episode. That that episode was spawned from us struggling to find a topic. Yeah. And then we, we at that point we had already been we've already been discussing about taking a break. Right. Because at that point, like, oh, you know, like the topics we we covered are kind of heavy. And we were <laughs> we were starting to feel at at this point. It's it's episode seven, but we'd probably been doing this for eight weeks straight or like ten weeks straight. Yeah. Um, and we were struggling to come up with something. We were both a little jaded by this point. And I remember getting up and I pointed at your PS5 controller and I said, Oh, <laughs> gaming. Game right now. Remember, we're gaming. It's like a gaming episode. And I said that jokingly, but it evolved into And then I, I pulled a SpongeBob. I said, write that down, write that down. Oh, yeah. it evolved into this assistive technology video gaming conglomerate thing yeah <laughs> yep yeah that was fun i'm really excited to you know see what assistive tech i end up using throughout the rest of my life too especially like the adaptive controllers um alexa make me eggs <laughs> <laughs> I, Those cooking I, uh, robots are coming, bro. They are. They are. If Make they can like deliver you food, at this point, if they can deliver you food, I don't think we're too far off from them cooking your food. So I, I still prefer a person. I don't know because I don't like the idea of a drone losing connectivity or something happening, just having a drone crash through the wind for my window of McDonald's in hand. <laughs> you know, it's got like a, an omelet, like fresh off the frying pan, and it just like crashes into your house and splatters all over and like scolds you but yeah going back to the myth, the myth for that episode i think the the main thing was there are barriers to making things accessible to everyone and those were you know it was money and external help a lot of the assistive technology required not only money but someone to help you set it up, like the adaptive controllers and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, get all the plugins and yeah. plug them in and order them in such a way that you could actually use it. So, yeah, because that's dope. Because I could pull up one day, you could tell me, Oh, Yuri, I'll check out this brand new adaptive controller I got. I'm like, Oh, that's sick. For a uh, Christmas I gift idea, the PlayStation adaptive controller. Hint, oh, yeah. hint, wink, wink. But yeah, but too. But what if I'm not there? You're too bad. <laughs> it's like I was gonna set it up for you. Uh oh. Uh oh. Spaghettios. Yeah. This is always kind of. It's kind of a bummer. A plight. With technology yeah. there. I mean, not to go back on the robots, but still, man, it just oh man, it's like it's crazy. Yep. I got fast mm-hmm. food and robots. It's because I'm like, <laughs> like hungry. <laughs> You're like. I don't really care about assistive technology. Just I need a robot to feed me. <laughs> I mean, I think that'd be pretty dope, especially if, well, A, if you can afford it, and B, if they have the technology up to that point. That'd be kind of dope to be in a somewhat automated house. And I don't, but still, it goes back to the fast food restaurant thing where you would still want humans or like a person somebody to be there full time regardless yeah even if you, yeah even if the the robots could do 80 percent of the work what in the off chance that something goes wrong right because remember your chair the other day <laughs> you have a smart chair but nothing was bugging out and i had to pull up an hour or so early and we had to figure it out and then oh, we had to we had to reset your chair. You remember that? Oh, the calibration on the tilting. Yeah, you yeah. calibrate. Imagine if you lived on your own. Who's going to calibrate yeah. your chair, right? You'd have to have the people that actually work on the chairs, like the, from the company, National Seating and Mobility, come out and do it for you. And like when I called them to originally do that, they said that they couldn't even schedule me for like a week just to schedule yeah. Like, not have someone come out, but just they needed a week to be able to schedule me. 
Right. And imagine like, if you lived alone, whatever, and if I wasn't in your life and you're just like chilling in your automated home, yeah. it's like, well, Dick, it's like now I'm kind of slanted forward and uncomfortable and I can't do nothing about it. Right. It just decreases your quality of life. Yeah. Right. I mean, you have the robot. Well, even though they, because I know the, the lift teams exist mm-hmm. um, and you have mixed experiences with them. I mean, overall, they're fine. I just like, I'm really weird about people picking me up because yeah. I'm in a really vulnerable position. And if they like move me the wrong way, then it's game over for like my ankle or something. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, what was it? Going and I'm just going to be in pain for several weeks. So, yeah. Well, it's, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of things that I, I, I think about that get brought up in my head. It's where, a lift team, so as simple as a lift team is pretty solid. Like me said, putting you using the the harness to get you in the in and out of bed, right? Right. Assuming technology reaches that point, we we went to a whole talk, a little TED talk, a little thing about soft robots and how mm-hmm. hard it is to actually make those. Yeah, a soft robot that is not only a hard robot but can safely and comfortably put you in and out of bed. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Like a plus, like Vine, just grabbing me. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe we should specify. The soft robot, what it was, it was essentially AI and a electronics and like wires or whatever. And they use air, air and then AI to kind of snake through snake fruit pipes and stuff and they're using it for surgery right like a way to snake in and out of people's intestines a way to perform surgeries or certain things safer because the whole point of the soft robot is that it's like less invasive they don't have to like cut you open yes find tumors and whatnot throughout your body they can just right this soft robot um through like your esophagus into your intestines to find stuff. Yeah. And then um, he pointed out one of the hardest things to do is replicate nature, like the, like um, just making a robot with the softest materials you can find based off of the human hand doesn't give you a human hand. Right. Like you, you could simulate the tendons and the ligaments and all that, but it's just our ability to control strength kind of mind-boggling for the robotic world yeah just the idea of just making it just the fact that it takes a like decades and like thousands if not millions of dollars of research to make a robot that could pick up an egg and not crack it Mm -hmm. like that well that's cool but how do you apply that to other things like what if that's a baby skull right well, now they have soft robots. I think that they talked about at the presentation where they could, they would go on to the site of like an earthquake where there's rubble trapping people, and the robot was thin enough and flexible enough to weave throughout the rubble and assess how many people were trapped under the rubble. Yeah. So the way that works is that it's a vibration and it's really cool. So, um, essentially the soft robot has kind of like a a shovel head or something and it's based off of moles right or animals that dig and what it is is that you put the soft robot in and it vibrates and when it vibrates it shakes the soil and the earth around it loosening it temporarily and -hmm. all that shaking makes the slow just soft enough and and then with enough power from the motors and stuff it, it can just like move around underground yeah it's really cool and, yeah now they're thinking about doing that with like little like i said small intestines and all that but ultimately i think i'm thinking about other tasks such as is getting you in and out of bed yeah i think we're just thinking a little bit too big picture here just, yeah because <laughs> well, i i, I I'm in the mindset where it shouldn't, it doesn't sound hard, mm-hmm. but I know 
when it comes to robot technology and stuff like some things are way easier said than done like i said it's just like the thought just trying to brainstorm some sort of device because there's so many layers of it like there's like the conceptualization of it and the idea and then the actual designing of it well and to get back to like the root of the episode that we talked about it is to be accessible to everyone yeah like that's, voice that's... Is, like voice accessible but what about the people that can't talk right well, not only that but like are the companies producing it gonna make it easily accessible like from a financial standpoint right? yeah because yeah, like right. you said a lot of these companies are gatekeeping the technology because they know they can make a profit off of it there's yeah. you know, numerous conspiracies and like rumors that cancer uh is completely curable at this point just pharmaceutical companies are gatekeeping the medication and the science because it's a whole business it's a whole economy right yeah, like well, when we were doing research, I told you that it's um it's really sad for elderly people because elderly people are the largest group of disabled people and ongoing disabled people. Yeah, yeah it's right. Um, and because we all get older, we all break down, and to remodel one's home to make it less of a death trap is insanely expensive. Yep. Right. And if you're not looking to sell your home, if you don't want to go to a retirement home, if you're, you know, if you're put in a situation where it's like, oh, do I live in my home or do I sell my home to buy a smaller home? Right. Like, do I, I don't want to go to the retirement home. I don't want to go to, yeah. Right. There's a lot to think about there. And that's where assistive technology should come in. You know, it should be accessible enough to the point where anybody that needs it can use it and have it benefit the quality of life yeah because like hear this just to get one of those walk-in bathtub things right i was looking at online there's only a few companies i could find that could actually do it here in southern california and all their uh, rough guesstimation or rough quotes were somewhere between 10 to 20 thousand and i'm like well shoot That's some of them very accessible <laughs> well some of them are even high as thirty thousand. But get, but that depends on what you want. Like if you just want just the bathtub, just the bathtub, maybe we're looking at fifteen, maybe eighteen grand. So that's but the that, thing. It shouldn't be like. But that's not your whole house, right? Right. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be what you want. It should be what you need, right? Right. That's yeah. Like it's especially like I said, if you've already retired, and you're getting um checks in the mail from retirement, right? It's like, well, shoot, are you gonna? pull i don't know 50 whatever grand or 60 100 grand maybe just to remodel your whole house that you're only going to yeah. live in social security an... ain't that much money <laughs> right well now you're in a position where all right i'm retired um my body doesn't work as well my house is slowly turning into a bit of a death trap right i'm 80 something i probably got realistically a good five to ten years left in me yeah right like five to ten that's not a whole lot of time right? am i really gonna spend a hundred grand to make this house you know old people proof right and i feel and there's a lot of old people that don't want to accept the fact that they're old right right i, I don't know it's it's a it's, it's quite like we we could we could have had a whole episode in just this one topic, just the elderly. Yeah, definitely. Maybe season, maybe season two, maybe season two. Right. Speaking of season two, we have a lot of new guests and new episodes planned. Oh gosh, yeah, it's in, we're cooking it's something. We are that. in the kitchen whipping up a flambe. I am telling you all. I don't that. like flambes, man. They kind of honestly, I've never had one. I don't even know what it is. I don't know why I said that. It They're is pretty so good, cool. but a little sensitive. <laughs> But yeah, we have a few different speakers that are going to be on as guests. One of them is a college professor, a marine biologist, actually. Oh, yeah. One of them is a professional certified dog trainer. 
That's right. And we have another one that's an international athlete and business owner. Dude, like, oh, dude. It's like. The flambe is cooking. I don't know what it is, but it's cooking. I don't even. I don't even know how we, how these people found us or how we found them. It just all worked out, and it it's just, just all worked. Out. It's just, it's crazy, man. Like, oh, I'm excited. Yep. Like, who would have thought? Those are pretty. Those are oh man, for Profe- the professional dog trainers uh, and the athlete. Oh man, it's just dope. It's, <laughs> nobody thinks about international disabled athletes, right? Right. In the words of Travis Scott, it's lit. It's lit. <laughs> But yeah, on that note, I think we uh we'll call the grand finale there. And before we do, I just want to thank you all for listening from the bottom of my heart. Oh yeah, mine going too. In, going into this project, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. We, we still, still don't. <laughs> you know, it's we, a... we really didn't expect much to come of this. Uh, like I said earlier, we joked about the twelve listeners on episode one, and now we're up to over sixty. It's something. Yeah. And because of the podcast, you know, we've gotten to meet and interview all kinds of people from different walks of life, all with the unifying factor that they all live with some type of disability, right? Right. And I think that's the whole point behind the show. We started this with the hopes of bridging that gap, like I mentioned earlier, and understanding between those living with the disability and those who aren't as familiar with this ability. So as my mouth is starting to tire out and my words are starting to slur, (laughs) thank you for listening to what we have had to say this whole time. We're really excited to bring you season two and Mm -hmm. a season that's bigger and better than the first. Uh, I don't think we have a confirmation date for season two, huh? Just sometime maybe December. Yeah, probably, uh, yeah. if I had to guess, I would say middle of December-ish. Middle? I mean... The hmm. good thing about season two is it's going to be more consistent. Yeah. So once it comes out, whatever day it comes out, it should come out that day of the week, every week. Right. Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas. I, think, I mean, that'd be fun. I mean, maybe maybe yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it after, behind the scenes, like yeah, middle of December, maybe... Maybe just right after Christmas, man. Start off the new year, right? Maybe. Yeah, we'll see. Depends, uh, I guess, how much we have done by... I know for sure we'll probably have maybe two episodes recorded by then. Yeah. I guess it depends how much... I mean, now we're talking, like, behind-the-scenes stuff now. You know, it's. I guess it depends on how many episodes we want on lead time, right? Right. Yeah, we'll see. Um, we'll figure it we'll out. See, we'll see. But yeah, look forward to it. Keep an eye on the socials, Instagram and Facebook. We might be trying to do some more content creative y stuff on oh, season. Some off season shenanigans. Off season oh, right shenanigans, now. yes, exactly. Like, Dominic's mentioned he's he wants he always wants to record me just dancing. Dancing. Yeah. No, I just, I don't know. He thinks like uh my facial expressions are really hilarious. Yeah, there's a whole side of Uriel that, you know, he doesn't quite show on the podcast, not to the latest <laughs> extent. Um, and so I think it'd be really fun to just do some off podcast can stuff. <laughs> <Fun. laughs> Alright guys, as always, peace and love, and may the force be with you. <laughs>